Hello everybody and welcome to the Epic Flight Academy. My name is Mike Thompson and you are here for the Private Pilot Ground School. There are three things that you need to do to be successful in Epic's Private Pilot Ground School course. Number one, you need to review this content in our online training course. Number two, you're going to review these videos in parallel to the content in that course. And number three, be sure to review all of this content with your flight instructor. Now, what is our topic today? We are here today to talk about air masses and fronts. So, what is an air mass? What makes an air mass? Obviously, it is a large parcel of air existing in our atmosphere. And some of these air masses may cover as much as a continent or half of a continent, or at least several states. So how do these air masses form? Well, we need two key things. We need an extensive area that's geographically uniform, number one. And number two, we need a region dominated by general stagnation of atmospheric circulation. Now, when that happens, the air over a particular geographical region will be able to pick up the characteristics of that region. When it does that, it forms an air mass and we label those according to those characteristics. On this diagram, you can see the North American continent. This is a typical summer pattern. And if that air mass were to stagnate over the ocean, maybe you can see it here over the Pacific or the Atlantic, we refer to those as maritime. If that air mass stagnates over the continent, we refer to those as continental. So we have maritime or continental. Then it's simply a question of how close is that air mass to the equator or the pole. If it's further north, we call it polar. If it's closer to the equator, we call it tropical. So what might happen if we had a large air mass over the northern Pacific? Well, it would be maritime because it's over water. And we would call it polar because it's further north, closer to the pole. And on our diagram here, you can see that would be an MP or a maritime polar air mass. How about an air mass that forms over West Texas, New Mexico, and maybe Northern Mexico? Well, it's continental. And if it's there for a while, it's going to pick up some warm air tropical characteristics. And you can see in our example, we might call that a CT or a continental tropical air mass. So that's how they form and that's how they are named. In the 1940s, Norwegian meteorologists called the boundaries between these air masses fronts. And guess what? The name stuck. So these boundaries between these different air masses we now refer to as fronts. So before we examine fronts in a little more detail, let's correlate some meteorological knowledge from past videos, specifically dew point, cloud types, and stability. Now in our diagram here, this is from a previous video, you recall what happens when temperature and dew point come together? Exactly. Fog forms or the, the uh, condensation uh, occurs, the water vapor condenses out of the air. And from previous videos, you recall different cloud types. Remember we had low, medium, high clouds and vertically developed clouds? Also from previous videos, do you remember we talked a little bit about stability and what it means to have unstable air? We were looking at this graphic and we saw our parcel of air rising into the atmosphere. 
where temperature and dew point came together and it was rising into cooler air aloft and so it was unstable. Now what I want to do is try to correlate all three of those concepts meteorologically and let's ask ourselves, in meteorology what might bring all three of these things together? The answer is a boundary between warm and cold air called a cold front. In the graphic in our online course, you can see a cross section of a cold front. This is an example of a cold air mass overtaking a warmer air mass. These cold fronts are relatively fast moving maybe 20 to 30 miles an hour. Now, that doesn't sound fast to you and I who are used to driving cars or flying airplanes, but meteorologically, that's moving along pretty fast. Now, some of these powerful cold fronts can move as fast as 50 or 60 miles an hour. That's a powerful cold front. Notice that these fronts cause a lifting action and they cause the moist warm air that they're overtaking to rise up over that cold air mass over that cold front. This causes the temperature and dew point to come together and there we see the clouds. We also have cooler air aloft that causes the instability we talked about earlier. So you can see how some of this previous meteorological knowledge now comes together and we can correlate it and start to understand what happens with this cold front. Those reasons are why we see things like cumuliform clouds, even cumulonimbus and thunderstorm clouds, unstable air, and turbulence associated with a cold front. So you might ask, what if it is warm air that is displacing the cooler air? Might that be called a warm front? Well, the answer is, yeah, you got it. That is a warm front. And you can see in your online learning course, this is a cross section of a warm front. Now, they tend to move slower. The reason is because warm air, as we know, naturally wants to rise. <clears throat> and it is a little more difficult for that warm air to push that cold air out of the way. So they tend to move slower that warm air will also tend to kind of ride up over the top of that cold air. You can see that in our cross section. And because the air aloft is warmer, the stability that we studied earlier will be neutral or positive. And this will produce some of those stratiform clouds that we looked at in an earlier lesson. These warm fronts may cover a wide area, anywhere from two to sometimes 300 miles or more. There are large areas of rain, typically not thunderstorms. However, they are still possible. The air is generally more stable, seldom turbulent, and because of that we're going to have poor visibility, maybe some prolonged rain and drizzle, possibly sleet and snow in uh, colder climates. Now that brings us to the third type of front. What if that cold air mass and that cold front were to slow down? and lose its energy and eventually stop moving. Or, by the same token, if that warm air mass and that warm front were to lose some energy and start to slow down and eventually stop moving. 
what you would have in that case would be what we call a stationary front. This occurs when either a cold or warm front slows so much that it loses its original energy and just stops. Hence the name stationary front. It's got warm air on one side and cold air on the other. And you can see that it's drawn with this line of alternating warm front signals and, uh, symbols and cold front symbols. Stationary fronts may have the characteristics of both a warm and cold front, which means thunderstorms are still possible. Typically there are large areas of stratus clouds. Now that brings us to the fourth type of front that we want to talk about, and this is called an occluded front. Now it's a little different from a stationary front because this air mass is continuing to move, but one air mass is overtaking the air mass in front of it. It doesn't stall and come to a stationary stop like a stationary front. It continues to move and overtake the one in front of it, and it occludes. These occluded fronts typically have three stages, and you see those shown here. Now, what we're showing here is the bird's eye view on the left and the profile view on the right. In the bird's eye view, what I want you to notice is this black dashed line from A to B. That AB dashed line is what we see on the right hand side in profile. So notice in the bird's eye view that AB cross section is cutting across this occluded front before it really starts to occur and we see a cold air mass on the left and a warm air mass on the right and the characteristic clouds of cold fronts and warm fronts are still occurring and you can see that in this diagram. Now in the second phase notice how that cold air mass starts to overtake and literally run over that warm air mass. And when that happens, these two are mixed together. And so those cold front symbols of blue triangles and warm front signals of red half circles are combined together into, you got it, purple alternating triangle half circle. And if you look in our second example here, we see that AB cross section coming through right about where that cold and warm front come together and start to occlude. So on the right, now you can see a real mix of cloud types. We see some vertically developed cumuliform over that cold air. We see some stratus clouds over that warm air. We see areas of uh, of, of large areas of rain and drizzle, and we also see some showery precip and possible turbulence from these vertically developed clouds. Now, as that occlusion continues, that takes us to our third example. Now, notice here, this is well occluded. That cold air has really started to take over that warm air, and look again at our AB cross section. Now we're going right across that occlusion, and in the cross section now you can see the cold air on the left overtaking the warm air on the right, and you can see some more stratus type and nimbo stratus clouds um, taking place with this uh, occluded front. So this is typically the three stages of occlusion, the types of clouds that might be associated with them. Well, folks, that just about wraps up air masses and fronts. Here's a quiz question for today. Name two things that are necessary for an air mass to form. Okay, think back. Now, if you said an extensive 
uniform geographical area and you said a region dominated by a general stagnation of atmospheric circulation so that air can pick up characteristics, you are right. Well, folks, thanks for being here. Join us next time.